Hello and welcome to Disseminate the Computer Science Research Podcast. I'm your host, Jack Wardby. The podcast is brought to you by Pomtree. Pomtree are the developers behind Raftery, the open source temporal graph analytics engine for Python and Rust. Raftery supports time traveling, multi-layer modeling, and comes out the box with advanced analytics like community evolution, dynamic scoring, and temporal motifs mining. It is blazingly fast, scales to hundreds of millions of edges on your laptop, and connects directly to all your data science tooling, including Pandas, PyG, and Langchain. Go check out what the Pomtree guys are doing at www.raftery.com, where you can dive into their tutorial for the new 0.80 release. So it gives me great pleasure to say that I'm going to be joined today by Moshe Vardy. Moshe is the Karen George Distinguished Service Professor in Computational Engineering at Rice University. Welcome to the show, Moshe. Thank you for having me. Let's let's start off with your story then. So kind of, I guess, walk us through your journey from, from I guess, day one, really. When did, when did you decide to become a researcher? What was it about computer science and databases that attracted you? Well, you have to go back. I have to go back to my childhood, sometimes in the early teens. My parents bought me like a 12-volume series. It was called the Young, Te- the Young Technologist. It was really, and it used to be a magazine by that name in Hebrew, was published in the 50s and the 60s. And then somebody did, the, the magazine stopped, but somebody took all the issues and put them together as a series of 12 volumes. And they gave it to me, and God knows how many times I've read that series. And it, this is when it became very clear to me that I want to become a scientist. So I had no idea exactly what, what, what scientists do, other than they made these amazing discoveries. How does science work? I had no idea. I really don't have any, I didn't have any mentor. Where I, I grew up on a kibbutz. So I was mostly focused on, on uh, farming, hospitality. Uh, my father, however, became a teacher. So I had a little more kind of intellectual uh, influence. But my father went to college just a couple of years before me. He went to college in, as an adult. But uh, I mean, to me, going to colleges, I want to become a scientist. That was very, very clear. So you go to your undergraduate degree, and there you get a little sense. In fact, I major in phys- my, my undergraduate major was physics. But somewhere we're talking about, now we're talking about, you know, the 19th, early 70s. By the time I went back to, I finished my military service. It's now we are talking late 70s. And I had this, this uh, inkling that computers are going to be a big deal. <laughs> That's some good now, foresight. <laughs> now, you know, it, now you think, of course, computing is a big deal. <laughs> but you go, back, you go back to the 70s. You have to remember that the microprocessor is, is you know, 1974, I mean, I mean early 70s. So there was nothing very clear at the time. Computers are a big deal, did information processing. They were all in the glass house. You access them using punch cards. You know, terminal was a big innovation. So there was no, there was no inkling that computers are going to be such a big deal. Looking back from where we are now, it's so hard to kind of believe that was once the reality. But yeah, I mean. And, but- and yet, yet I had this intuition that computing is the wave of the future. I kind of tried to go back to my, to, I wish I could go to a time machine and interview, interview the young Vardy <laughs> yeah. and, and ask him, how did you have this intuition? What was the base of your intuition? But, you know, I don't know. I, I enjoyed programming. So I decided to go, to, when I go back to graduate school, I will leave physics behind and I will go to computer science. And, you know. There is a phrase that says that all the big decisions in life you make when you're young and inexperienced. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. And, and you hope that you're making good decisions, but this was a great decision. So young Vardy made a good decision. <laughs> computing <laughs> computing is the future. How did start with databases? You know, as, as many things thing in life, serendipity is a huge factor. There was a, a graduate seminar and what the graduate seminar was, the, 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 the professor assigned papers to read, and you had to read a paper and give a talk on the paper. That's it. And so he gave me a paper that he found interesting. It was in database theory. And really, my task was to give a talk on that paper. But at the very end of the paper, there was a research problem. And I was intrigued, and I told him, no, this sounds really interesting. Maybe I'll think about it. And the rest, as they say, is history. So unlike computing, which I started with 
some intuition about the future, database was just pure serendipity. Here is a problem. I find it interesting mathematically. Let's think about it. Awesome. That's what, really how it started. What was the paper? I think it was by Meyer, Sagiv, and Yanakakis. And this was a topic that is less active today, but, but at the time it was people realized that the data that you get, you know, the issue, the issue we're struggling with today, you know, you, you, you fill in your, your relation with data. How do you, how do you check for errors? Maybe mm -hmm. there's some errors in, in entering the data or where you got the data. So people came up with, with what we call now integrity constraints. For example, if a person work in an organization, they probably only have one salary. If they have two salaries, something is fishy there. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is one of the effects of life. You only have, a, inside organization, you have a single salary, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the way they like it. So this is the fact that every employee should have a unique salary. That's what we call integrity constraints. But the way you describe it now is there is a dependency between the employee number and salary. So it's not just a dependency. It's what we call a functional dependency. There should be a function from employee number to salary. It's a function. So, so, so this became known as functional dependencies. And all the way from, from the beginning, the early days of the relational model, Ted Codd, who, was the, who had the idea of the relational model in 1970, introduced functional dependencies as a way to also, it suggests to you how to organize your data. And then people start introducing other type of dependencies. And so for a while, it was part of what are dependencies? What kind of other dependency we have? So there was something called functional, that there was a function. But then someone introduced multi-value dependency, which is in some sense, it's a, it's a function from again, employee number, but to a set of, a set of things. Okay. For example, maybe if the database has a, has also, also children, it's a function from the employee number to the set of, that's a dependence that this employee has. So this became known as functional, as multi-value dependencies. And, and then people start realizing that once you have these dependencies, you can learn about more about the data by making inferences, reasoning about these dependencies. So you mentioned, I'm interested in automated reasoning. This was kind of the first, the first example. So let's suppose that there is a, a mapping between a functional dependency between employee and department. Every employee works for a unique department and every department has a unique manager. Now you can infer that every employee has a unique manager. So people started having reasoning about, about data dependencies. And so the question that was posed in that paper was, is there a, a system of rules by which you can reason about a class of dependencies called joint dependencies? And joint dependencies are generalization of multi-value dependencies. I, I won't get too, too technical here. But now, now it's a question, you know, now one of the things that people who are interested in computing, usually these people love to solve puzzles. So why do we like to solve puzzles? That's an interesting question. Who cares about the puzzle? But somehow the puzzle, it's your brain against, against the puzzle. Okay. And one of the things that I'm very often, the people who are attracted to computing have, are kind of a bit of brainiacs. They, you know, they like to think about challenge, challenges. They enjoy kind of intellectual challenges. And they also like a world where the rules are very, very clear. So when you write a program, there are clear rules. The program has to compile and run correctly, okay? So the first time you run a program and you get, I remember the very time you get a program and you get, you think maybe there was a compiler error. And then you realize, no, it's not a compiler error. And you get wrong result. And eventually you learn all the mistakes are yours. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a fantastic, this is a fantastic, I, I look at it and say, what a fantastic training in humility. You, mm. you come and you, you know, nobody likes to admit their mistake. That's very true. And so you write a program, it doesn't work. You think, you know, something must be wrong. The computer is buggy. The compiler is buggy. Something is wrong. And the answer is, you go to your professor and say, look, I wrote a completely correct program. I get wrong result. The answer is, go check it again. Okay. The bug is in, the, you made the, yours fully responsible for your own bugs. Yeah, yeah. I've never encountered a bug where you could say, well, it's a compiler error. I've mm. never yet. I mean, it's not impossible because a compiler is, at the end of the day, a piece of software, yeah. but it goes through such extensive testing that I have never run into a case where the program was right 
but the compiler was in error. So it's also a fantastic uh, training in humility. These are the rules, live by the rules, live and die by the rules. Also, it has, I think, many people that attract to computing, especially at, 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 in, I, was, I was 16 when I started playing with computers. And I would say it's probably the people like, like me who get attracted to computing are not always people with the, with the most elaborate social skills. And the nice thing about computers, the rules are clear. On the other, on the other hand, when you're age 16, the rules about girls are nothing, <laughs> nothing but clear. Okay. Yeah. Very puzzling. Very puzzling. It's very hard to figure out what are the rules. So here is a place where you can challenge yourself, and the rules are clear. So you kind of you get attracted to just just it's you against the the difficulty of the puzzle. And programming by itself is like puzzle solving. But when you come to doing more what we call especially theoretical research, again, it's just a, it's just a mathematical problem. You're pitting yourself against a mathematical problem. And so I read this problem. I said, wow, this sounds like a very interesting problem. And you start thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. Ultimately, that gave rise to my master thesis and eventually also to my PhD dissertation. Just thinking about this problem, trying to solve it. And usually when you see things, you say, well, you know what, maybe if we generalize it, it will be either easier to solve, sometimes because you, it's more abstract, you, can, you find a way to easier to solve, or by showing that you cannot solve it. Mm. Okay, so partly what when this, my dissertation was about was generalizing this class of functional and multi-valued and joint dependencies and coming up with a general logical formula, formulation of, this, of such dependencies. Today they're called TGDs and EGDs, and I do not think we, we need to dive into that. And then I could say, okay, when can we solve this problem? And when is it not solvable? So one of the, the things that I found when I was a master's student, I, I was in a class where we, we learned about unsolvability. There are certain problems that are not solvable. The most famous one, of course, is the, the halting problem for Turing machines, okay? Unsolvable problem. And I learned it for the first time. It's an amazing result, negative result in mathematics. It's usually much more difficult and quite amazing to prove that something cannot be done. To prove that something can be done, you just show how you do it. But to show that something cannot be done, that's an amazing intellectual, intellectual thing. You know, it's going back, can you square the circle? <laughs> okay, can you trisect an angle with, with, a, with a ruler and a compass? Okay, these kind of negative results are some of the most ama amazing results. Can you solve quintic equations by means of, of uh, polynomials and radicals? All these are negative results and usually require a lot of advance to show, no, this cannot be done. Mm. So, so when I learn about unsolvability or undecidability, it's mind-blowing. Now, I remember going to my advisor, uh, Katriel Beeri, who also a very well-known database researcher, and I tell him, I just learned about undecidability today. Maybe, or this week, maybe this problem I'm working on, maybe it's undecidable. And he said, oh, come on, this is, this is not some fancy theory. This is a database. This is we are practically, practically systems people. But eventually it was shown that I, I was able to show that this problem was unde undecidable. Do you remember the moment when you when you finally managed to demonstrate it? How did that? What did that feel like? And was it was it the classic eureka moment, or was it more a kind of it happened slowly over time and then it was done? Like, well, the way the way we we prove undecidability is today we show if you can solve this, you can solve the whole thing problem. That's how we show it. Since since we 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 know already the whole thing problem is undecidable. To show that something else is undecidable, you show if you can solve it, you can solve the whole thing problem. But usually it's not directly. It's what we call, this we call a reduction. You saw, if I can solve one problem, I can solve another problem. But now we can have a chain of reduction. You say what, you know, if you solve B, you can solve A. And if you can solve C, you can solve B. And if you can solve D, you can solve C. So, so I was able to show something like, well, if you can solve Z, then you can solve Y. Okay, yeah. And Y was already connected by a chain of reductions. And so partly you kind of have to find the right problem. You have to find the right Y. You have to find the right problem that on one hand, it is known to be already known to be undecidable. And on the other one, it's close enough to your problem that you can do, you can do this reduction. So 
partly it's really kind of a bit fishing, fishing in the dark. You get some flavor, what kind of problem I'm looking for. And I spend lots of hours in the library hunting for problems. And remember, there's no Google search. You want to search, you go to the library, you pull out volumes, and you look through papers. There, there was one advantage of this. It sounds like today, it sounds like oh, practically medieval. <laughs> but it has one advantage today. You, search, you, you do a Google search, and you get your result immediately. There, you had to actually go through many, many journals. And you make a lot of serendipitous discoveries along the way. Mm. Yeah. It's, a, it's the same thing that, that when you look for a book in the library, you go to the card catalog, and you kind of look through it, but you have to go through the cards. It's called a card catalog. There are cards for each book. As you go through the cards, you see other books. Oh, that might be interesting, so, yeah. And then off you go. This yeah. might be interesting. When you go to the shelf, you look for your book, but there are other books around it. So you make, you know, we have become, this is another theme of mine. I'll, I'll go on a soapbox that, that computing is, as a discipline is very focused on efficiency. Let's do things in the most efficient way. And the answer is that, yes, it is efficient. But it's efficient. Efficiency is a short-term optimization, but it's not always a long-term optimization. And in fact, we, we made this big realization. I got this big insight during COVID. And, you know, you can ask, you know, there were lots of warnings about, a, about the global pandemic. You can go through the, 19, the 2010s and you find a book from 2011, the coming global pandemic. And you ask yourself, how come we're caught so unready? And the reason is, because it costs money to get ready for a pandemic. That's true. Yeah. Now, it costs way more money to be caught unready for a pandemic. By, by, so, there's no comparison. It may have cost billions to get ready. But today we know that cost of a pandemic, people have tried to compute the economic cost of the pandemic economically in terms of loss of life. Just in the United States, we're talking like something like, I don't remember the precise number, but somewhere maybe around two and a half trillion dollars. So investing $10 billion in, in pandemic preparation would have been an enormous bargain. But $10 billion, who wants to spend $10 billion? Maybe a pandemic will not happen. So we tend to be uh, very cheap when it comes. We want to be efficient and also spend money when we don't need it. So again, we've become very efficient with computing, but we're not counting the loss, okay? And part of the loss is that when I would look for a book in the library, I would discover other books. When I look at the card catalogs, I would discover other books. When I go look for articles, I would discover other articles. And as technology gets better and better now, this is part of my worry is, are we again becoming more and more efficient? efficient? So it's still, when you do a Google search, at least you see the, top, the first screen. Nobody look beyond the first screen, but at least you see the, first, the, tap, the top 10 links or something on the first screen. Now, when you go to ask uh, ChatGPT, that's it. You only get the answer. Uh -huh. They're never the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth uh, hit. So we're becoming more efficient. What are we losing? Anyway, going back there, eventually I found problem Y that I could reduce problem Z to. And uh, I was able to do it. And I mean, let me kind of regret, digress a little bit more. When I was about 10 years old, there another formative experience. I, I mentioned this. Encyclopedia, the Young Technologist. Mm. Another formative experience was I had a, a math, this is elementary school, I'm in fourth grade, and I had a math teacher who really would like to have been a mathematician, but at this point, he's just teaching math to elementary and high school students. Eventually, he went back to university, finished his PhD, and became a mathematician. But at the time, he was just teaching, but he, was, he wanted to more than just teach, so he decided to create a math club to take the, the kids who are a little better in math and the, maybe the, better than the average and have special advanced math classes to teach them in the afternoon. And the club did not last very much. Not enough kids were interested in math. That's a shame. But I remember the very, very first, the very first or couple of, of classes, he talked about matrices and determinants. And my mother told me later, I came home and she asked me, so how was it, Moshe? And I said, it was, oh, it was, it was beautiful, I said. And my mother had very little formal education. Her math meant she could do arithmetic. Okay, that was her yeah. math. She could add and, add and multiply numbers. That was her math. And uh, so the concept of beauty in math was completely foreign to her. So when I said it was beautiful, she said, do you mean interesting? 
She told me the story later. I have no memory of it. She told me later. She said, you mean interesting? I said, no. I said, beautiful. I meant beautiful. So I found the beauty in math. And you can explain beauty in math the same way you cannot explain beauty in other things, okay? I mean, most beauties are mystified by the phenomenon, phenomenon of beauty. Because beauty in people, I think, is, is somehow one or another related to sexual attractiveness. So it's kind of we're biologically primed to be attracted to or realize attractiveness of other people. If it's, a, mm-hmm. if it's a someone of the, of, the, of the gender you're attracted to, then you're attracted, or you see someone of your gender, you say, well, that's a competitor, so you are somehow <laughs> making judgment, okay? Yeah. But I, I, I look at mountain scenery, and I, I, I'm awed by mountains. Mm. And I found, found a mountain scenery beautiful. And I ask myself, why do I find it beautiful? I don't know. I look, you look at a, a bevy of butterfly it, in, in, we have in, here in Houston, a Museum of Natural Science, and they have a butterfly pavilion. And you go there and it's full of butterfly. And I say, oh, this is so beautiful. And I ask myself, why do I find butterflies? Be- they're colorful, okay, but why do I find them beautiful? And I cannot explain it. It's just, I find it beautiful. And I find math beautiful. And I, I have no explanation. It's just a sheer elegance of the abstract structure and the hidden structure you find, you know? Think of something like set theory or graph, take graph theory. Set theory is even more. What is set theory? What is a set? A collection of objects. And then you start saying, okay, if there are two sets, I can define a relationship between them. One set is contained in another set. Every element here is also element there, okay? All apples are fruits. That's a contentment relationship. And then you start building on that and you form, you form a mathematically, one with incredibly deep theory with deep, deep mathematical questions that are still open. And it's an amazing phenomenon. It's just absolutely amazing phenomenon. What the, and again, yeah, there are people who look at math and they say, well, all you see here is, excuse me, flies making, uh, excuse me, shit on the page, right? All these, <laughs> all these cryptic yeah. symbols, okay? <laughs> And, other, yeah, and I look at them and say, wow, look at this beauty. So yeah. I always find beauty in math. And theoretical computer science is, I don't like to call it it's a branch. Some people call it just math. To me, it's more it's a particular type of applied math because we have an application at the end. So math, mathematician gets permission from society. It's an amazing provision of society. It might be, we don't know what it's good for, but do it anyway. Why? Because history has taught us that you can do something which seems completely useless and then later it will become useful. So uh, Hardy famously thought about, about like analytic number theory, I mean, number theory, prime numbers, totally useless. He, and he enjoyed the useless beauty of it. And he was very proud. This is of no use to anyone. And then prime numbers became the foundation of cryptography today. So we, we are telling mathematicians, go ahead. Go ahead, do the math. Maybe one day it will be it will be it will be useful. We're just giving you a very long rope. Just do it. We don't know what it's good for. Go ahead with it. The same thing is true in some sense for the theoretical computer science. Just do your theory, but we hope it will be useful. My critique here, and I think that that many theoreticians think, okay, I have just like mathematicians have permit permit to do just whatever they want to do. We should have permission to be the, to do the same. But that mathematician can point out to a, a number of huge success of theory. And I think computer science doesn't have such a, long, such a long list of theoretical results that end up being very useful. There are a whole bunch of them. So in fact, we have today a special award, the Kanellakis Award, for theory and practice. And this is for theoretical advances that did prove to be ultimately, ultimately useful. Which were exactly? So there are many such like that. I received yeah. one for yeah. developing for another line of work that have nothing to do with databases, which look at the at a formal verification. How do we prove uh, properties properties of uh, systems, hardware or software systems? And there was a bunch of ideas people came before, which is that uh, you you know how do you first of all how do you prove correctness? What is correctness? So the idea was that. To specify correctness, you should completely stay away from the how it's imp- being implemented. You just should talk about the, how does it behave. So if you're talking about, for example, about a, a vending machine, if I push the coin, 
and I punch the button for what kind of drink I want, I should get the drink, okay? How it's implemented, I have, most of us have no idea what, what's, be, what's inside the machine, right? Put the coin, push the button of what you want, okay? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a black tea drinker, okay? Okay, yeah. Without, without, without any milk, okay? Just is, it York, is it Yorkshire tea, though? Because that's the important thing. Yeah, yeah, Yorkshire <laughs> tea, no milk, just 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 black tea, dark yeah. tea. I like Earl Grey, it's my favorite. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I should try Yorkshire, Yorkshire. You put it on my list. I'm right <laughs> down, Yorkshire tea. So, um, so when I, when you say, what does it mean for the machine, vending machine to be correct? It's completely at the interface level. If, if you, if you put the coin and push the button, and probably in that order, first push the coin, then push the button, then the, 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 the drink will come out. Exactly the drink that black you, box. That you order. Yeah. yeah, it's a black box. Yeah. So that's, we said, that's the way you specify a of system. It has to be a black box. Okay. It's just at the level of the interface. And an amazing discovery that was made by Amir Noel in the 1970s was that to borrow a logic that was developed by philosophers. And by the way, he told me the story was that he was reading a book by by a logician and then as he finished the book and he he decided the book was actually not relevant to what he was interested in as he closed the as he closed the book on the back cover of the book it says other books by the same author and another author was rec- another book was recommended he said oh this sounds interesting and that book was called tense logic tense logic was an, a bit some old name but today was called temporal logic and he he find the other book and he said that's what I was looking for. So now we have a formal logic that can talk about this abstract behavior, the interface level. And uh, that's the logic he proposed, temporal logic. And ultimately, he received the, the Turing Award for this discovery that you can use. And this was until that time, it was a logic pursued purely by not even mathematicians, philosophers, because the goal was to try to understand how people use time when they talk about time, how do people reason about time? And so the philosopher did what also mathematicians do. They try to abstract it by creating a temporal logic, a logic just about time. And, you know, there was partly the debate was, debate that later actually came also to, to be a debate inside computer science. Is time linear or branching? So linear means, I, you know, at the end of the day, you know, let's imagine at some point you live your life and then you get to the pearly gates and they say, what did you do in your life? And the answer would be, well, you did this, and then you did that, and then you did this, and you did that. It would be a one line. Mm -hmm. This is the story of my life. On the other hand, if we believe that we have free choice, then as we look forward, we see a structure of forking path. I may do this, or I may do that. And if I do this, then it will be another choice. So as you're comprehending your life now, you see lots of possible paths. So should we think of, of time at the conclusion, so to speak, so it's just one path, or should we think of time as a as a tree or forking forking path? Yeah. And this seems this seems a very abstract philosophical problem. Is time linear or branching? And I use it sometimes. I was I found myself at a, at a, some forum in which somebody wanted to debate whether there's, there's really human cause climate change and. And I said, before we, dis- we discuss climate change, let me pose another question. Is time linear or branching? And I explained the two choices. What do you think about that? And of course, he, is not, he didn't have the dimmest idea about this. And I said, what do you think? You know, <laughs> you can't even answer a very simple question <laughs> if you experience every day. What do you think you could reason about climate change? Yeah. <laughs> but That's in- in- interestingly, this debate this debate about the nature of time end up being a very pragmatic debate inside computer science. Mm. But the point is, I'll, we can put it on the stack, that story, but the point was that Pnoeli said, this logic developed by philosophers is exactly the logic that I need to describe precisely. Logic give you, what does logic give you? Logic is a formal language to describe properties of structures. So, so logic was for its first more than 2,000 years, was philosopher trying to describe what is correct reasoning. That was the purpose of logic, to try to formalize correct reasoning. If I have an argument, am I 
you know, two people arguing, and we have to subject their arguments to the test of logic. Does, mm -hmm. does the conclusion follow from the, from the premises, right? An argument starts, this is my premises, and I will show you from my premise how the conclusion follows. And so logic was the, the study of arguments, of correct reasoning. Then something amazing happens in the, in the, in the, in the late 19th century. First, there is a, a, a foundational crisis in mathematics. Because what happened is that we talk about set theory, and then one of the, and, and one of the operations that happens in set theory is you can take a set and you take the collection of all subsets of that set. So you start, let's say, the set of natural numbers. That's in very intuitive laws. We all know what the natural numbers are. Now let's look at the set, the collection of all sets of natural numbers. This is called the power set. And then in, in the 1870s or 18, in the night, I forgot the precise year, but sometime in the second half of the 20th century, of the 19th century, Georg Cantor shows that the infinitude of the power set is larger than the infinitude of the natural numbers. So there are infinitely many natural numbers. Surely there are infinitely many sets of natural numbers, but he proved that it's a bigger infinity. Yeah. Which is always mind bending. When everyone ever says that to me, it's mind bending. It's yeah. Mind bending. Yeah. In yeah. fact, he proved there are infinitely many distinct infinities. Okay. So, so it's really mind bending. I remember once try to explain it to, to my by now departed brother-in-law. And he just could not comprehend this. I mean, he is a lay person and he just could not comprehend it. There are different types of infinities. It's either infinite or not. Come on, what is this infinite? Yeah. Like, Pick one, yeah. This is like, <laughs> this is like, this is not asking how many, how many angels can dance on a pit head. What is the, what is the infinitude of, the, what is the infinitude of, ang of angels that dance on a pit head? Okay. <laughs> and later on, in fact, we get into paradoxes. The Russell's paradox is a contra seemingly a contradiction in set theory. And people says, look, we have to have put mathematics on, soli on solid, on solid foundation. What could the solid foundations be? And the answer was that it was proposed, and it was good for while it lasted, eventually did not succeed, was logicism. Logic is the absolute investigation of truth. So let's base mathematics on this absolute inve on investigation of true and false. Mm. So suddenly, suddenly logic become from just talking about a, a, a reasoning, just arguments, become a language to describe all mathematical structures. And so suddenly we have a language to, to talk about. And so in, the answer was people ask, what is the language of mathematics? And if you look at, you open a math paper, it's going to be a mixture of English and formulas. And, and Georg Gottlob said in, 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 in a book in the 1870s, everything can be formalized in, in, in logic, in first order logic. So now we have logic. So what the advantage is now we have a language Unlike English, which is incredibly ambiguous, just think of the example if I tell you, I only board your car. 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 You see, just by changing the stress, I'm changing the meaning of the sentence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The most famous case, the most famous of the ambiguity of, of, of a natural language was, was, was stated by Bill Clinton, who was challenged because he stated about his relationship with Monica Lewinsky. He said, there's no sex in that relationship. And when he was challenged later, he answer was, it depends on the definition of is. <laughs> and most people saw that he was some smarmy lawyer. But, but the, word is, is the word is in English is ambiguous. It turns out it's yeah. ambiguous. There are many yeah. mean, different meanings of the word is. But, but logic forces us to be incredibly precise, mathematical precision. Mm -hmm. And so Amir Noeli take this attitude. You can take logic from its initial use and you can kind of borrow logic to describe things. And said, temporal logic is exactly the language we need to describe abstract behavior of vending machines. Because mm -hmm. now I can say very precisely, if you push a button, if you put a coin, and then you push a button, then, then a drink will come out. So now, once you have that, you said, okay, you can now take, you can specify properties of systems, but how do I check that the system satisfied that property? And that was an important uh, uh, progress of, of the 1980s that 
people came up with algorithmic methods to do it. Not just methods to do it, algorithmic methods. That is to say, you, we now have a system where you give it, you have tools, where you give it a system. For example, if it's hardware, it will be a, a very log program. Very log is a hardware description language. You can give it a very log program, and you can give it a property written in, in temporal logic. What you use today is some industrial variation of temporal logic. For example, there is a language which is an industry standard called SVA for system very log assertions. So system very log is a hardware description language and a simulate, simulator for it. And now you can write an assertion in SVA. And then there are tools that would say the system satisfied or doesn't satisfy. It. And the question was, okay, they would debate what is a good algorithm for it. And Pierre Wolper and I made a connection through automata theory. Because automata theory is also, automata theory defines what we call formal languages. And formal language looks at formal words. And words are just sequences of characters. So you can think of such as a word as an abstract behavior of a system, just a sequence of observations. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the course, if you've taken, are you, what's your, what's your undergraduate degree? I, I did maths and economics was my maths and economics, maths mainly and economics. statistics, right? Because it was like econometrics and then like yeah. stats. So yeah, that was so, my so, so if you take a formal language, uh, formal languages course in computer science, you learn about automata, which are abstract machines that recognize formal languages. But the typical focus there is on languages that consist of finitary behaviors, finite sequ sequences. But it turns out already going back to, to the early 60s, so automata theory, the foundation were laid out in the, in the mid 50s. But in the early 60s, people said, well, suppose I'm interested in infinitary behavior. So it's a world that starts at some point, but it just goes on and on forever. Goes on and on forever. Like our system, you know, if you look at the system today, in principle, you think this laptop of mine should be able to run forever. I know that it won't. At some point, you know, the, something will happen mechanically, will happen to it, it will start failing. But at least we'd like to think that it's capable of running forever. Yeah. So let's imagine that the behavior, what is the behavior? All the inputs that it gets, all the inputs are the, the keystrokes and the, and, the, and, the, and the packets that arrive on the, on the, on, on the, on the network, network ports, and the output is all the pixels on the screen. So now a behavior is, is an infinite world. And so it turns out that people already in the, in the, in the 60s came up with a, an automata theory, what we call omega automata, because it ran on, on a world is of the same length as the natural numbers. There is a first letter, there is a zeroth letter, the first letter, the millionth letter, the billionth letter, the trillionth letter, it just goes on and forever. And in 1986, uh, Pierre Wolper and I made a connection to this uh, problem of verifying temporal properties via a detour through automata theory. And it was mathematically very elegant. Beautiful. But beautiful, okay. beautiful, very beautiful. In fact, I, people say, wow, this is, this is so, so beautiful. You go through automata theory. And, and never become very simple if you go through automata theory. In fact, the paper was first rejected because the reviewer said it's too simple. <laughs> and so Pierre and I added another section that was complicated. <laughs> And the paper was accepted, and nobody ever reads the complicated section. The whole point of the paper was it made complicated things simpler. But scientists sometimes would like to see it must be, if it's simple, then anybody could have done it. And don't realize yeah. that the, the brilliance is sometimes coming up with a simple solution. Okay? The beauty and simplicity, right? This is, it, that's, it, that's, that's so it, true. Yeah. It, is, it is simple after you had the idea, not before you had the idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but it turned out in this case, the simplicity meant that this is actually end up being also very practical. Mm. So it took some years, I would say, you know, the, the, our, the paper, our, we started working, our first paper was written in, in 1983. And it took almost 20 years before it gave rise to industrial tools. But today, that theory of Omega Automata, that sounds incredibly abstract, is the basis of industrial tools. It's industrial reality. Is, is, is that the thing you're most proud of? It, 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 kind of all the things you've done, like, has that had the most impact, you think, of all of, all of that's your That's the research? thing I would say, okay, so that's the thing that has most impact. Yeah. Okay? It's, 
you know, it was a, I kind of remember when, when we came up with this observation, wow, we can use automata and suddenly everything become very simple. Yeah. And both Pierre Wolper and I thought, wow, what a, what a beautiful idea. Okay. And then the paper get rejected because it's too simple. <laughs> but ultimately in this case, simplicity, uh, mathematical simplicity, I mean, it is simple and not simple because it is simple after you laid out an abstraction. The abstraction is omega, omega words, omega automata. I mean, you kind of have to be very abstract. I mean, I, you know, I'm explaining to you because you're a little bit of, of, of a mathematical background. But if I try to take a person that has even, that's a college education, but not in math, that would be very, very hard to explain. Yeah. A finite set machine running on infinite words. It, you know, the machine has to be finite state. It's very, very important. But the world itself is infinite. And it will be very, very hard to explain. But for people that look at math, remember the 10-year-old who said this was beautiful? Yeah. yeah. It's a, it is, I think it's a beautiful idea. And uh, I mean, it turns out that the connection to automata was essentially followed up from earlier work. But the earlier work would have made it was completely impractical in some sense. Right. And we right. found a very practical way of doing things. And so that ultimately led to, to all the way to industrial tools. And uh, in fact, just last year, Pierre and I received an award for a, a high impact paper in, in electronic design automation. Because this paper that was written uh, almost 40 years ago is now the basis of industrial tools. So theory can have can have lots of lots of indust industrial impact, but partly the impact happened not just because it was possible, but because, for example, I spent much of the of the following years working on making it practical. It didn't just happen. So a colleague approached me, Doron Peleg, deserved the credit for for coming to me and said, why don't we try to reduce it to practice? And we wrote, and this was a, a, a more than a decade after the initial paper. And I said, yeah, let's try that. And he, he did the coding also. He took on himself to do the coding. And it proved to be, while, while it was exponentially in the worst case, it proved to be actually well-behaved in, in what we call in the typ typical case. And so that, first of all, and then start, other people start doing research on, on improving the performance of the tool. And by the late 90s, I started consulting with Intel. And at that point, academic research showed that this tool can be quite practical. So I was able to propose to Intel, let's implement this approach. So in this case, I would say I, I accompanied the paper all the way from the mathematical conception to the empirical, empirical uh, evaluation and, and then through the tech transfer process. So it took, it didn't just happen because, you know, I could have publish a paper and just say, okay, I'm done. Okay. Mm. Which I have to say, which was my, the first decade after I did it, I said, I proved the theorem, I'm done. Okay. But uh, then I was inspired by, you know, I mean, a good scientist uh, is inspired by people around, there are lots of smart people around you all the time. So you should take advantage of it and be open to good ideas. And so, I mean, sometimes, you know, I was, you know, as I said, Ron Pelik proposed it to me and I said, let's work on it. And then Intel asked, would you like to come to consult, consult for us? And I said, yeah, that sounds interesting. And then when you're consulting, you have to, I went there with an attitude of, I'm going to go and listen to their problems. I know people who try consulting selling, well, I have a hammer. I'm going to sell my hammer to industry. But you have to come and listen to your, their problem and see, no, I think I, have, I, have, I think I can help you with your problems. So that was that was very, very productive line of work. I said it took to get it from conception to practice took over took about 20 years. It, it takes some work and, and willingness to accompany the work along different different uh, different stages of the work. So that is probably my most influential work in terms of all the way to, to industrial tools. And now the lesson from that is in, in especially today when I do even most of my so when I, I have students who do, I wouldn't call it theoretical work, but they do algorithmic work. And most of them, I tell them, develop the algorithm, then implement it and evaluate it and see how well it works. And very often we find that this is not just a way to make it closer to practice, who are still just doing research. But we actually, sometimes we look at the performance 
And sometimes we, we implemented something and the performance is, is, is pretty bad. But then we ask, why is the performance so, so bad? Then we go back and we improve the theory. So, so this feedback, I mean, this is, if you think of, of, uh, of science, but uh, if you look very often how, how natural science is made, okay? Physicists, they're physicists, they're theoretical physicists, and they will just do theory. Yeah. But everybody understands at the end of the day, there has to be, the theory has to be subject to experiment, and the experiment will either be consistent with the theory, which will reinforce the theory, or it will say, no, the theory doesn't match what we are observing. And we go and, back out again. Yeah. And, and if you have a theory and you say, well, there's no way to test it, then we're saying, well, it's a nice story, but it's not science. I think the same, can be, the same kind of thinking can be applied to not everything in theoretical computer science. I think there is room for theory that just, you know, people who prove lower bounds or undecidability, it's also useful. But I think a lot, a lot of theory could benefit from this feedback loop of mm. theory, experiment back to theory, back to experiments. And sometimes the theory community I find is a bit too elitist and to say, no, no, I just, I just want to prove theorem, yeah. you know? And people use the phrase, gets my hand dirty, which, which I think it's an obnoxious phrase. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing dirty about writing code. Uh -huh. You know, in fact, even writing proof is like writing code in some, in some programming language, okay? So, so um, I think computer science could benefit from more, more, cooperation between theory and experiments and even in some cases tech transfer fantastic well that's a great message to end on there Moshe thank you yeah. thank you so much for this okay. chat Sid. Um, but yeah fantastic I think where can we find you on socials for the listener if you want to go on? I mean I think uh, you, if you yeah. if you go uh, uh, at Vardy that works on all social media perfect well I, I'm on uh, Facebook and Twitter and Mastodon and LinkedIn Great stuff. Okay. Thank you very so much. Yep. And um, yeah, we'll see you next time for some more awesome computer science research.